As you know, about 10 to 10 in some parts of Australia, 10 to 8 in other parts, plus or minus an hour and a half, then three hours. But right now, it's about 10 minutes before 2 o'clock in Israel, and that's where my dear friend Sherry Markson is ahead of October the 7th uh, and its anniversary tomorrow. We all know how deeply she has felt this issue, how excellent her reporting has been, and she is in Israel right now, where um, she is getting ready for a week of what are going to be impactful shows and make sure that you watch it each and every night. Shari, nice to see you. Uh, I've been following your socials. To see things with your own eyes, what's it like? Paul, look, thank you for having me on your show. As you know, I've given my heart and soul to reporting on what happened, the terror attacks to Israel over the past year. But being here in person, and I spent the day yesterday at the Kibbutzim and at the site of the Nova Music Festival, and actually speaking to people face to face, holding friends, giving them a hug, holding them in your arms, who watched their best mates be shot and die right next to them, young women at the Nova Music Festival, this brings the reality of the war and why Israel is in a war, why it's fighting to bring home 101 hostages who are still in Gaza. It brings it all home. And Paul, already the people I've spoken to, the stories they've told me are so powerful. There was one Australian murdered on October 7. Her name is Galit Carbone. She's a grandmother. She was a grandmother. Her brother took us through her home, her kibbutz yesterday where she had harrowing final hours as she bravely, as a 66-year-old grandmother, tried to fight off Hamas terrorists. There was no lock on her safe room. She battled to keep the door shut. She never made it. Paul, his interview was powerful. Here's just a snippet of what will play on my program tomorrow night. It was all around 6.30. I was already on my bike on my way out for my morning bike ride. And then there were the rockets. The rockets uh, came down really heavily, uh, way more stronger than the usual ones that we, so, so to speak, used to. And I stopped. And then, and then afterwards I realized that a friend of mine saw from his house all the, um, the Hamas uh, guys uh, on their bikes and their pickup trucks. And Paul, the reality is we just keep hearing these demands from the international community and including from our own government for a ceasefire. When you walk through the streets of the kibbutz, you see the burnt out, destroyed houses. You see a pink little girl's bicycle laying on the ground. You hear the stories of the 10 month old twins who were shot dead. A little girl, orphaned, three years old. It is just so devastating that Israel cannot continue to exist with the threat of these terrorists so close on their border, on the south with Gaza, on the north with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And, you know, it's all very well for Penny Wong in Albanese, thousands of kilometres away, to demand that Israel doesn't defend its citizens, that it lays down arms, but that is not what is going to protect the people here. And I tell you what, Galit Carbone's brother, Danny Mazna, he told me he's never been involved in politics his whole life. He knew who the Prime Minister of Australia was. That was it. But now he feels passionate. He is furious at Penny Wong for the fact that she came here to Israel and she didn't bother to go bear witness, to visit the kibbutz or the site of the Nova Music Festival. He thinks that is unforgivable. And I tell you what, that's how most Israelis feel towards the Albanese government. Now, what we can see behind you is what seems like, obviously, a, a normal, everyday Sunday, but obviously the size of Israel, to drive from the north of it to the south of it, is about six hours. That wouldn't even get you halfway across a place like New South Wales. We know what's happening to the south. We know what's happening to the north. What sense have you been able to pick up about just how close to absolute instability and carnage, while at the same time where you're standing is in a level of peace, but at a moment's notice that could be disrupted and everyone's going downstairs to a bomb shelter. Yeah. I mean, this is the incredible contradiction of life in Israel. Israelis get on with life. They pick up, they carry on, they go to restaurants, they go to cafes, you know, very resilient people, Jewish people very resilient. Israelis have had to live under the, the constant threat of potential attack for decades. Yet, at the same time, what happened a year ago has shaken Israel 
in an unprecedented and Im unimaginable way. People are broken. You barely meet anyone who hasn't been affected by those terror attacks. Um, it, it has been quite extraordinary. And yes, so at the same time, people get on with life, but everybody has on their phone, and I've now got it as well, um, an app. So whenever there's a rocket siren, you get a notification. And I tell you, Paul, it pings all day long. Wow. And if you're in that area, you've got to get straight down to a bomb shelter if you can. And the communities in the north, you know, the media doesn't care to report that 80,000 Israelis have been displaced from their homes because of the threat of Hezbollah near the Lebanon border. So this is, you know, a community that's, that's very affected, very aware of the situation, but life goes on. So good to talk to you, mate. I'm out of time, but I can't wait to see what you've got to say tomorrow about Macron basically saying it's time to you know, starve Israel of weapons to defend itself. Yes. Can't wait to see that. 8 o'clock uh, in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, 7 o'clock in Brisbane, and you name your time everywhere else for Sherry tomorrow night. Love you, darling.